currently we're campaigning for a, an apology for the people that were put in those dreadful experiments and I've tried to get it included in the Scottish Child Abuse Inquiry because there was physical abuse in putting people in such degraded conditions. I mean, we had to study in a room with no heating, but with a candlelight. I mean, it was worse than Dickens. And you had to do it because if you didn't go to school and you didn't turn up, and if you turned up unprepared, they got on you and sent notes So, And if you didn't go to school, they came to the door. And if you didn't go after that, you were taken and put in a home because two or three people were. So I said that there was physical abuse from the conditions you put us into. There was also physical abuse because when you went to school, they said, oh, you're one of the dirty tinks from the huts. Here, take that, kick, slap, knock you over the bank. And I remember when I was six getting dragged across the playground, they were trying to pull my arms out of my sockets. And the teacher was looking, she never did anything. When I went in and said, this happened to me, she went, don't tell tales, get on with you and sit down. These were the, the way you were ostracised. There was emotional abuse, there was psychological abuse and ostracisation, and that continued out in the town. So there wasn't role models, it was simply a case of a strong feeling of, you know, things not being fair, injustice, I suppose. I always have a very strong sense of fair play. I'd say it goes deeper than just noticing these things. I think it took me back to my childhood when I was terribly bullied at school. And I thought, you know, nothing's ever changed. Nothing's changed. 82% of Gypsy Traveller children saying, um, I've been bullied at school, I've suffered racial taunts, I've been beaten up, all the things that happened to us. Um, and even within the school, you, you know, there was no uh, knowledge that you were speaking a different language because we were speaking can't. My, my first uh, remembrance, memory of inside the school was getting these big brown envelopes with four pictures and four words that you were to put to them. And it was like tractor and house and or car and house and woman and hen. And they were giving us these words in English and I hadn't heard them. They kept sitting every day for a year trying to just go meeny, meeny, manny, mo and trying to find out which one I went with. Um, and then they sent me along to a child psychologist who said, this very intelligent child, why can't you teach her to read and write? And actually Sandy that's on his way here, it was next door, he was about six years old and he'd just sit with me over the summer and drag my hand to write my name and eventually managed to write my name. And then that was, I was in primary two, I learned to read and write. And in primary four, I was first in the class, so it's a case of, you know, putting some effort in to realise people have a different language, a different culture. And that just wasn't there. And I don't think it's there today either. That's why only 4% go to secondary school and only 1% come through it. Because they're trying to force everyone to be mainstream. And it's a non-mainstream culture. It's a marginalised culture. It's always lived on the fringes historically. And mainstream policies, particularly under the current uh, SNP government, they're very positive about mainstream and everything and decentralisation of power, that, that has a very uh, adverse impact on my community.